Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that he gave his everything. And that's why we're able to come here today to sing praises to his name because he first gave to us. And, you know, have you ever thought about this? Not only uh, because Christ gave his life for us are we saved and we have the hope of eternal life in heaven, but also we get to serve him here. We get to serve his church. He gifts all of us to be able to serve him. And part of that service involves deacons. As, uh, as uh, Brother Bradley had already mentioned, we are currently taking deacon nominations. And what I want to do is I just want to read out of 1 Timothy this morning, 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 8, going through verse 13. These are the qualifications that the Bible says are required of, of, of a man who is faithful to serve as a deacon. The Bible says deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first, then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. The wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So just want to encourage you, church family, as you're praying about who to nominate, to just take this scripture and uh, just let the, the Spirit teach you about what are the qualifications of the deacon. As, and as you come to church, uh, you begin to look around and you say, okay, Lord, who is it in this church body fits these qualifications that you think would serve well as a deacon here at First Baptist Church. So with that, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for saving us. Lord, we know that we can confidently say that we're saved because you did give your all for us. Lord, your word makes it clear to us that you want us to know whether or not we have eternal life, whether or not we're forgiven. Lord, you, you don't want us walking around with with doubt and uncertainty regarding our salvation and Lord I pray today if there's anybody here who they they are uncertain they're not positive that they're saved they're 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 unsure of whether or not if they were to die today they would go to heaven Lord I pray that you would point them to Jesus today that they would get that settled today Lord we thank you that not only do we have the certainty of salvation through Jesus but also you allow us to serve your body. And Lord, as a church family, as we begin to nominate men to serve as deacons, Lord, would you lead us in that? Lord, may we elect deacons biblically, those men who by your grace are qualified to serve in that office. And so, Lord, we thank you for this time as we come to worship you. I thank you for each and every person that's here today. I pray for the burdens that we all carry. I pray for the, for the both spoken and unspoken request. Uh, Lord, we pray for your hand of mercy and grace to be upon each of those requests and uh, Lord we just pray that above everything else that we will leave today knowing that we've been in your presence we pray that you would have liberty today to work in our midst Lord we thank you that you speak to us Lord we thank you that you you want to have a personal relationship with us and so Lord may we leave today changed uh, Lord may we we again know that you've been amongst us and we pray Holy Spirit, that you would do warfare over us as we know that we have an adversary, Satan, who wants to take our focus away from Jesus. And we pray that this place would be set aside for your use today. Lord, we thank you and praise you, and we ask these things in Christ's name and all God's people said. Let's sing The Church is One Foundation. The church is one foundation.
I know whom I believe. I hope you do. If you do, smile real big.
chapter 14. We're going to be in verses 7 through 14 today. Luke chapter 14 verses 7 through 14. Before the choir gets too comfortable, I'm going to invite you to stand as we honor God's word today. Luke chapter 7 or excuse me, Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 14. The Bible says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited. Then he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, at least someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Thank you, and you may be seated. Well, today, I wonder if you have an attitude today. Do you have an attitude? And that's the question that's really going to be the focus of our text today. Do you have an attitude? That's the, that's the question that we are confronted with in our text today. Uh, in fact, in today's message, Jesus teaches about two attitudes, two attitudes that kingdom people must have. These are two attitudes that if you belong to the kingdom, you should display these two attitudes. You know when we say, do you have an attitude, most of the time we take that in a negative sense. It's not good to have an attitude. Well, in today's text, we see that there's two attitudes that Jesus wants us all to have. Now today, we get a special privilege today to be able to once again have lunch with Jesus. As you know, last week we had lunch with Jesus. Hope you enjoyed your lunch with Jesus last week. I have another good lunch today with Jesus and as well tomorrow, or excuse me, well yeah, we'll come back tomorrow. How about that? Uh, Next Sunday we're going to have lunch with Jesus 
again. I say that because all this, this text here, beginning in uh, chapter 14, verse 1, going all the way through verse 24, is centered around a table. This is where Jesus was invited by a prominent Pharisee. We saw that last week. He was a ruling Pharisee. And uh, we found that he was invited by this ruling Pharisee, not so much so that they could enjoy a good meal with Jesus and have fellowship with Jesus, but really he was invited because they wanted to watch Jesus. He was, he was under the microscope. We saw that last week. And uh, the question that we were faced with last week was, how do you receive the truth? How do you receive the truth? The truth. Sadly, the, the nation of Israel as a whole had rejected the truth, they rejected the truth of who Jesus Christ was. And so we were all faced with that question last week as they sat there and they watched him and they wanted to catch him violating the Sabbath as they more than likely planted uh, this man who had a disease. More likely they planted him right there in front of Jesus because they knew Jesus would heal the man and they could accuse him of violating the Sabbath, which was an indicator that they were completely blind to the truth. Now this week, as the lunch continues, we find that the tables are turned. Now it's no longer the Pharisees watching Jesus. Now Jesus is watching and observing his fellow guest. We're going to see that here as Jesus confronts the Pharisees. And I, and I just love this about Jesus because Jesus is going to confront uh, two groups of people. Number one, he's going to confront the, the, the people he is sitting with, the other guest of this, of this banquet. And then he's also going to confront the host. Now what is so important for us to understand is Jesus here is not being vindictive and ugly by confronting these people. He's not returning uh, ugliness. I mean, their, their motives were impure by questioning Jesus. But Jesus here, he is confronting them. Listen, this is what's, this is what's awesome about Jesus. In His mercy, in His grace, He is confronting these who were so ugly to Him, who He knew their, their hearts were wrong by inviting Him to this lunch. He is confronting them in order to give them an opportunity to repent. That is what is amazing here. And Jesus always did that. In order for somebody to repent, they had to be confronted with the truth. And we too should pattern our lives after Jesus. In a spirit of love, we should be willing to confront error with truth because you can't repent outside of being confronted with truth. And that's what Jesus here does. Not only here, but we see this throughout Jesus' life. He's constantly confronting people's sin with truth so that they can have their eyes open and repent and be forgiven of their sins. So today as we seek to discover this truth about kingdom attitudes, uh, what, what two attitudes does Jesus want us to have as kingdom people as we seek to do that? Uh, Jesus, in order to answer that question, what he does is he, he instructs us on very two important matters. All right, I'm going to give you these matters because these really serve as the, the major, if you're taking notes, these are your point one and point two. By the way, um, I'm, I'm making a commitment to you that I'm going to begin putting my notes on the screen. Don't expect anything fancy because I'm not real technologically advanced. It's going to be very basic, but it'll be there uh, for you to help you uh, take notes a little bit easier. But today, taking notes again, two, the two major divisions today. First of all, point one comes in verses 7 through 11. That is this. Jesus teaches us, he instructs us, where to sit at the dinner table, okay? So we're going to find out today where to sit at the dinner table. So when you go after church today and you go to lunch, you'll know where to sit at at the dinner table, all right? Number two, not only are we going to learn about where to sit at the dinner table, but we're also going to learn about who to invite to the dinner table, Verses 12 through 14. Who to invite to 
the dinner table. Those are our two divisions that we're working off of today. So, number one, where do we sit at the dinner table? Where do we sit at at the dinner table? Verse 7 through 11. Now, under that, under that major heading, we're going to look at three, three things that Jesus does here. First of all, in verse 7, notice Jesus' observation. Jesus, again, verse 7, you see that he is observing. He is observing. It says, when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor. All right. So he, he's sitting there. He's not the host, remember. He's not the host. He is a guest. And he notices how the, the Pharisees around him were all scrambling to get the, the most important seats, the places of honor. Now, we have to get into the, the culture of Jesus' day to really understand how this worked in Jesus' day. Back in those days, when you had a, a dinner event, the table would, would be in the middle and the guest would sit around the table in a U shape. Okay? The very middle, the, at the bottom of the U there, would be the dinner host, the one who was hosting the dinner. And it was understood that the closer you got to the host, those were the prominent seats. Those were the places of honor. Those were for the most important people. So, in the Pharisees' mind, they were all about being built up. They were all about being noticed. They were all about having status. So they would jockey, if you will, to get the most important seats, the seats that were closest to the host. So if you were all the way at the end of the table, you were kind of seen as the least important. Now the text doesn't say it here, but more than likely because these Pharisees had already all fought to see who could get to the closest places to the host, Jesus more than likely, as he is confronting these Pharisees' sin, more than likely he was sitting probably at the very end of the table, which is only fitting. Because when we look at Philippians chapter 2, we see the humility of Christ. He didn't come to be served, but he came to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. So he makes this observation. I mean, you can just see it. These Pharisees, they were, they were all probably uh, had been kind of you know, just scurrying about, seeing who could first sit down to get closest to the host. Because in their minds, not only was it their position at the table that reflected their overall position in society, in a way, uh, it created your status. If you were able to sit near the host, that gave you status. So that's Jesus' observation. But then in verses 8 through 10, we see Jesus' instruction. He gives them some instruction after, after he observes their behavior. He gives them some instruction. Again, they believe that getting ahead socially required self-assertion, status-seeking. And Jesus tells them that the way to get ahead was to take the place of least honor. He says in Matthew chapter 23, you don't have to turn here, I'm going to read it to you. Matthew chapter 23 He's speaking of the Pharisees, starting in verse 5. He says, They do all their deeds to, see, be, to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. And they love the place of honor at feast and the best seats in the synagogues. So he gives them a parable to help them to understand this lesson that he wants them to learn. And there's no doubt that, that more than likely he has the book of Proverbs in mind as he's giving them this parable in verses 8 through 10. Uh, Proverbs chapter 25, verses 6 through 7. Listen to what the Proverbs says. It says, Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, Come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. So he gives them some instruction. He says, if you attend a wedding feast, which would have been a very important feast, he says, this is what you need to do. He says, when you first come, don't go to the, to the 
to the chair to the to the seat. They didn't have chairs back then. They would sit on like couches and they would lean on an elbow. He said, "Don't go to the to the most prominent places first. He says, instead, you you go to the very back first, so that you're ultimately not humiliated. I mean, can you imagine if okay, you you hurry up to the front to sit right next to the host, and then the host has to come up to you and says, "Hey." I'm sorry, pal, this is reserved for somebody else. And then you got to get up, and the only seat that's left is in the very back of the room. You'd be humiliated. Again, honor was very important in those days. So he says, instead, you go ahead and sit in the very back so that somebody else, the host, can go back and bring you forward so that he can exalt you. He's saying true honor comes when you first take the lowest seat, and let someone else, again in this event, the host, exalt you. So we see the observation, the instruction, and then in verse 11, we get the application, Jesus' application. Notice verse 11, he says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So the application is simply this, the way up is really down. There's a paradox. The way up is down. And this is polar opposite of the way that Jesus' world thought, and it's polar opposite of the way our world thinks. Our world says, hey, if you want status, you fight for it. But the way of the kingdom, because God's ways are not the ways of men, he says, hey, if you truly want to be honored, you take the place of humility. Because the way of pride ultimate leads to ultimate disgrace, and the way of humility leads to ultimate reward. Jesus wanted them to understand that the prideful will be shamed and the humble will be exalted, and certainly don't miss the spiritual application here. This is a parable. Remember, parables were earthly illustrations to, to demonstrate a heavenly application. All right. so, so this is really a picture of the heavenly banquet where Christ Jesus will be the host. And what he's trying to teach these, these Pharisees is simply this. If, if you one day want to be exalted by the Lord to sit at the heavenly banquet table, you must first take a place of humility. And if you'll notice, if you skip, up, skip on to verse 15... They, they understood. They understood the spiritual application because verse 15 says, when one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. So in their pride, they, they were convinced, they were sure that one day they would sit at the, at the banquet table in heaven. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. So, where do we sit at the dinner table? We sit at the, the, the lower places. It's a lesson on humility. Well, number 2, verses 12 through 14, he teaches us now who to invite to the dinner table. Now what he does here in these verses is he turns his attention now to the host. Because, you know, as Jesus is teaching previously, the host is sitting there thinking, well, this really doesn't apply to me because I have a reserved seat. I already have the place of, I, I have one seat to sit at. That's the, the host seat. So he wouldn't have been fighting for a seat. And so now Jesus turns to him. And ultimately what he says to the host is he says, hey, this lesson of humility applies to you as the host as well. So he first of all, in verse 12, he speaks of a worldly practice. Notice again verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him. Again, this man was a ruler of the Pharisees. Very well could have been part of the Sanhedrin. The, the Sanhedrin would have been the supreme court of the Jews in that day, a very important individual. And Jesus turns to that man and he says, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. Here was the worldly practice of Jesus' day. This is the way it worked. When you invited somebody to a banquet table, it was understood that they had to repay or return the favor. 
In essence, it was, hey, you honor me, and I'll honor you. You elevate me, and I will elevate you. You scratch my back, and I'll scratch your back. So their gesture of kindness, because this was not, don't, don't, don't misunderstand, this was not a potluck dinner. We like those, don't we? A potluck dinner is when you're invited to something like that, you, you're expected to bring a dish. Well, this wasn't a potluck dinner. If you hosted a dinner, you provided everything. All right? So if you were a guest, you just came to eat. You didn't come to bring anything. But the worldly practice was is that their, their gesture of kindness and hospitality in reality had strings attached to it. Ultimately, it was still, the host still was about advancing self because you would only invite people and he lists out four groups there friends brothers relatives or rich neighbors you would only invite those who had the means to return the favor the host ultimately was using people for personal gain instead of truly loving them and serving them because you see, honor and prestige in the eyes of the Pharisees was established not only by where you sat at the table, but also who you sat with. So Jesus here, he's, he's helping them to understand that, hey, you only invite those people. You will only do for those people who can do back for you. As far And then he lists out, he says, as far as inviting the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind, you wouldn't even think about inviting those people because those people don't have the means to return the favor. So a Pharisee would never invite someone who was a beggar because a beggar couldn't then throw a, a dinner where he would reciprocate. So that was the worldly practice. And then he concludes in verses 13 through 14, by giving a heavenly promise. It says, verse 13, he says, But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So, so Jesus here, as he gives this heavenly promise, he says, he, he's not teaching, don't miss this, Jesus is not teaching that you're living in sin if you invite a relative to lunch. It's not the point of, of the story. But what he is teaching is, is that it is a sin only to invite people who can ultimately return the favor because you're really, it's really about selfishness. You're really only looking to have, you're really only doing a supposed act of kindness in order to get something in return. But he says, if in humility, if you will in humility and selflessness do good to those who have no way of repaying you, there is a heavenly promise that in the resurrection you will be repaid for the kind acts that you had done for people who could not do anything in return for you. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. It says, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and He will repay him for his deed. So what is the application here? How do we apply this text today? So we go back to our original question. Do you have an attitude? I want everybody to leave today knowing whether or not you have an attitude. And again, in this case, it's we want to have an attitude. We want to have two attitudes. What kind of attitude does Jesus require of me? Number one, as we're applying this to our lives today, Jesus requires me to have an attitude of humility. That's what he wants. If you're truly part of the kingdom, you will display an attitude of humility. Now, what is, what is humility? Is humility walking around saying, oh, I'm just worthless, I'm no good? No, because we are good in Christ. By the way, that's where we get our identity is knowing who we are in Christ. A biblical humility says, I am not worthy of God. It's not like, you remember the, the Pharisee who went to the, to the temple to pray, and he goes and he's so full of pride, and he looks over at the 
wicked tax collector. And he says, oh God, thank you that I'm not like this sinner over here. Biblical humility says, I am not worthy of God. There is nothing in me that merits God's favor. Outside of God, my heart is desperately wicked. What is that old hymn that says, uh, talks about, the hymn writer talks about he's a worm? Where's Brother Mark? Yeah, what is the name of that song, Brother Mark? At, at the cross, such a worm as I. I think there's been some revisions. We don't, they kind of take out that word worm because, you know, we don't want to call ourselves a worm. But you know what? Outside of Christ, that's what we are. We're sinful. There's nothing that, that we have naturally that merits God's favor. So biblical humility says, apart from Christ, I am nothing. Biblical humility is always accompanied by a growing awareness of your magnitude, of your own sinfulness that produces, listen, a growing appreciation for God's grace and forgiveness because you recognize that outside of God there's nothing before you came to faith in Christ there was nothing that God looked down at you and said oh wow he is such an outstanding individual no it was only by God's good grace it's only by God's good grace that we're here right now and when you begin to recognize the goodness and grace and the love of God you begin to recognize how good God is in your own life and how much you need him. Biblical humility, listen, doesn't demand personal rights or demand the last word. Pride says, well, I deserve better. Pride says, my voice needs to be heard. Biblical humility takes the place of least honor and said, it's not about my personal rights. It's not about my voice being heard. Biblical humility doesn't strive to be noticed. If we were all humble today, and I hope we all leave today with some humility, we would all have to say that there is a longing in all of us to be noticed. Couldn't help but notice. On Thursday, we had gone to Anna Marie taking gymnastics up in, over in Bainbridge, and afterwards, her and Carly were playing on the, on the uh, bars. And Carly grabbed a hold of the bars, and she would not be satisfied until her daddy took notice of her. Daddy, look at me! And you know what? So often all of us are just like children. It's acceptable for children to be that way. It's not acceptable for grown adults to be that way. But so often is that not our attitude? Hey, look at me! Biblical humility doesn't strive to be noticed. Biblical humility says I'm willing to take the low place so somebody else can have the higher place. And Jesus ultimately raises up those who are willing to go low. He's saying don't push for glory that you achieve through your own efforts. You receive glory by first humbling yourself and acknowledging your great need for me. The only people who one day will sit at the heavenly banquet table in heaven. And by the way, there's going to be a great feast in heaven. Aren't you excited? But, but I've got news for you. It's not going to be exciting because there's going to be great food there. And I believe it's going to be great food. It's going to be great because we're going to be seated with Jesus. And the only ones that will be there, the only ones of us who will be there, are those of us who first take that first act of humility and say, Dear Lord God, there is nothing in me that merits your favor. I'm a wretched sinner. I have, I have offended you as a holy God, and I need your forgiveness. There is no help for me outside of your forgiveness. So Jesus requires me to have an attitude of humility. Number two, and finally... Not only does Jesus require us to have an attitude of humility, but Jesus requires us to have an attitude of sincerity. Sincerity. True ministry out of Christian love serves and gives without thought of return. Without thinking, okay, 
what am I going to get out of doing this act of service? It isn't manipulative serving for what you can get out of it. As Christians, we should pattern our lives after our Savior, and we should serve others out of love for God and others. The rabbis had a saying that the best kind of giving was when the giver did not know to whom he was giving. And when the receiver did not know from whom he was receiving. If you're going to do an act of kindness, whether it's some kind of act or giving, do it not so that you can be recognized, but you do it out of your love for Jesus Christ so that He can be magnified. Sometimes when I walk into the average Baptist church and I see the hall of brass plaques, I think, who are we more concerned about magnifying here? Are we more concerned about magnifying our charitable deeds or Jesus Christ? He wants us to be sincere. He wants us to do things because we truly love Him and we love others. It's not about bringing the attention back on to us. And you know what? Here's the truth. This is what I believe that Jesus is trying to tell us here. Oftentimes, as believers... When we do things for others, when we give a, 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 a dinner, when we invite people, this is just an example, when you do things, oftentimes, sometimes, you will never even get a thank you. But Jesus wants us to know that, hey, if you're doing it with the right motives, your concern is not about the earthly return, your concern is about the return you'll receive in glory. And ultimately, your concern is, is that you're doing it so that Christ can be glorified. So we have to ask ourselves this question. Why do I do the terrible things that I do? Whose interests do I really have in mind? And this is something that if we're really going to say, okay, Lord, would you search my heart and let me know where my attitude is today? Ask yourself this question. When I do something, whether it's at the house, or whether it's for a neighbor, or whether it's here at church, when you do it, do you get upset when you're not recognized for doing it? Jesus wants us to have an attitude of sincerity, so that when we do things, we have the other person's best interest in heart. We're not doing things in order to get something in return. So, I close with this simple question. Do you have an attitude today? An attitude of humility or an attitude, in an attitude of sincerity? Well, let us pray. Father, Lord Jesus, Lord, we, we thank you that you confront with truth. And Lord, if we're going to be honest today, we'd have to say that this truth, while it's easy to amen to, but Lord, it's really difficult to apply because Lord, and all of us, we all have a heart that is bent towards pride. Lord, we can, can, if we're not careful, find ourselves even doing things that from the appearance of men look to be acts of charity, but in reality we're doing it because we have ulterior motives, because we want to get something out of it. Lord, may we be people who are marked by humility, Lord, may we recognize that there's not a single person here in this building, in this world, that outside of Christ deserves your favor. Lord, we all, the only thing that any of us deserve is to forever be separated from you in hell. But Lord, we thank you that in your marvelous grace, you save us and you redeem us and you change our hearts and you transform us more into your image and while every single day even as saved people we struggle and we fail and we still have times when we allow pride to take over our hearts Lord if we're in Christ we're cleansed and that is our hope and may that be our identity and Lord we just pray that we will be a people who are marked by humility and sincerity so that ultimately through our lives others around us won't look to us the attention won't be placed on us 
but the attention will be focused to Jesus. As the world looks and sees the difference that you make in our lives, may we be like mirrors that reflect the image of Jesus Christ because, Lord, we know that it is your desire for the world to worship you. Lord, we pray that during this time of invitation that we would be obedient to you to do whatever it is that you lead us to do if you're speaking to us right now and you're telling us that there's a decision we need to make. Oh, Lord, help us to not allow pride to keep us from being obedient to do that which you're calling us to do. Lord, we give you this time. We pray that we would leave obedient and we ask these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. All right, this time I'm going to invite you to stand as we have our hymn of invitation. Hymn number 465. Is God speaking to your heart today? Maybe today you say, you know what? I've been coming to this church for a long time. I know all the right things to say. I know all the right things to do. From a worldly perspective, I'm a really good moral person. But I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I have a home in heaven. And maybe today your greatest need is you need to step out in faith and trust Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. He came, remember, not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for us. We all need Jesus. So today, if you need to be saved, would you step out and run to Jesus today? If today there's something you're struggling with, maybe it has nothing to do with what I've talked about today, and you just want to come to these altars, and you want to cast your burden upon the Lord, would you do that as we sing to the Lord? Hymn number 465.